Hello, my name is Robert Betts. I'll be your instructor for the online theories course. I've been a teacher here at UCI ESL for 20, 20 years or so now. And I came here in 1990 and started teaching ESL beginning of my career. And I started doing teacher training in around 2004, which this course is part of that. This is the theories of second language acquisition course discussing uh, different philosophies or theories uh, or approaches that people have as to how do how people learn a second language and what are the best ways to do that. This is not the methods course which is more specific in terms of what to do in the classroom but this is stepping back looking at some of the research and looking at some of the more general ideas of what we think is the process of learning a second language uh, uh, right now I'd like to talk about the the textbook that we're using and uh, there's an introduction to the textbook which I'd like to discuss a few things. One thing, uh, we're talking about education. There's a lot of psychology involved in terms of how people learn, how people remember things and how do we feel during that process and how does it affect kind of who we are and our, our identity and of course a lot of linguistics because we are teaching English which is a language so we become somewhat experts on what language is and what language is made of and uh, pedagogy as well just teaching how to teach what a teacher does does a teacher stand up and lecture in front of the room does a teacher walk around coordinate groups or projects uh, does a teacher motivate students, assessing students, and the whole area of, of studying a language and setting up a program. And there's no real correct way to teach English, so that's why we call it theories, basically, and approaches. We have a lot of research on it, but it's not really scientifically fixed as to the best way to teach language. But we do have some ideas, uh, we, we generally are, believe that we have to bring in more communicative type of activities into the classroom. And a general idea of trying to make, trying to tap into our natural ability to learn language a little bit, and in terms of maybe looking a little bit at how we learned our first language, and maybe applying some of those ideas to learning a second language. But there's no real set answer. We're still teaching a lot of grammar, and we still feel there's benefits teaching grammar. We're still kind of memorizing vocabulary, and we're still, you know, repeat after me type of exercises. But again, mainly in general, trying to move into very integrated type of learning experiences for students, and uh, getting away from just thinking of language as just translating something from one language to another and <clears throat> uh, kind of get even getting away from memorizing dialogues uh, to learn language kind of memorizing this dialogue and pronouncing it with someone and controlling the language and uh, kind of getting away from some ideas like that um, <clears throat> and it's hard to evaluate the effectiveness of your your teaching in terms of how well it's working. There are national exams and international English tests like the TOEFL or the IELTS that can somewhat measure someone's language ability, but it is hard to really evaluate, but we have a general sense of what what's working and what's not working. We all have our own experiences of learning, of learning and uh, we have our, usually we all have experiences of learning second languages as well. So we, that kind of gives us an idea too of what we might want to do or what we, thinks work, what we think works. The, um, <clears throat> the, the general idea of trying to learn language, a second language, at a younger age we believe is effective. If we can get children interested in learning uh, foreign languages, we can get them to learn. We think that that's a better time in life to be able to handle this fairly complex process of acquiring basically and learning this new language but as you know in most schools around the world we don't start learning foreign languages until 
junior high and high school or even really college getting real serious about foreign language study. <clears throat> and learning a second language is not exactly the same as when you learned your first language. We're learning a lot uh, of things about language acquisition in general, but it's not an identical process because when you learn your first language, you're, you're an infant and you don't have another language to confu get confused with and and your brain is different the plasticity of your brain and and the, your whole ability to learn and take on new cultures and concepts is different but we're just trying to learn like some things so that we can make second language learning kind of as natural as possible <coughs> uh, individuals are different too so what might work for one student in terms of their learning style or their strategies is going to be different than another student. So now we have to consider that variable in terms of sort of visual learners or auditory learners, people who like to work alone, people who like to work in groups, and it becomes customized in a way. Although we're teaching a class, so we, we have a limit in terms of how we can teach, but we do have to keep in mind, in terms of being effective, what might be effective for one student might not be for another. So students develop their own little strategies like flashcards or doing a lot of reading or having conversation partners. And we all kind of over time figure figure out maybe what some of our learning styles are. Also we want to correct our students but we can't correct every mistake they make because we can't really interrupt them all the time. So we have to decide when to correct them and then how directly or indirectly to correct them. So whether to point out the mistake they're making or maybe kind of model the correct way to them and hope they pick it up or uh, possibly ask them what mistake they think they may have just made, things like that to make the, the corrections more in, indirect. Of course, we don't have to correct at all if we're totally focusing on fluency and we just want you to keep trying and talking and making mistakes then I might not really correct you at all until possibly at the end of our conversation I might point out a few things and <clears throat> also keep in mind some people are better language learners than others so language is a strong subject for them and they seem to have a knack for it mm. And that's another thing we're interested in is kind of what makes a good language learner. Sometimes it's psychological, like they're very open-minded uh, or they like to travel and <clears throat> they have this kind of openness to, to other cultures. And then sometimes we think, you know, is there sort of a scientific aspect to language, like the linguistic part? Some people like grammar, for example. Or is it all about people skills and wanting to really communicate with people? Um, and the, another issue, just by way of introduction, is when a student makes an error, is it because they're confusing their first language with this new language, English, which would be interlingual error, or are they just making a mistake in English, like he walk instead of he walks, which is just an intralingual error, meaning the same type of mistake that a native speaker would make when he or she is learning English just as they get used to the system. So we have to identify kind of where that error is coming from and that might help us find a way to correct it as well. <clears throat> um, also another big question we have uh, by way of introduction is we tend to teach English from simple to complex, simple words, simple structures, we get more complex later but there is an argument to introduce some of the f more frequent type of language, even though it's not that simple, but it's very frequent. The students will need it very quickly. For example, you know, how long have you been here in the U.S., which is not a simple verb structure, but is possibly something that they need to know. Uh, natural language learning, when when we're learning our first language, we're introduced to a lot of complex structures early on because they're frequent, they're needed. 
Uh, another uh, concept is uh, group work, pair work, which everyone thinks sounds great, but when you get real beginning students, sometimes we question, like, how can we do group work if the students are having trouble communicating to their partner? Or maybe they feel like, oh, my partner is making all these mistakes, and I'm making mistakes, and we're learning each other's mistakes, or something like that, or creating these bad habits. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, in terms of the classroom, as we try to uh, create a natural environment, sort of like the real world, trying to recreate that in the classroom so we can practice this skill, I usually say, you know, language is a skill. It's not just a, like a body of information to remember, but it is a skill, sort of like uh, sports, when you're learning a sport, you have to you have to play the sport a lot. Uh, musical instruments require a lot of sort of hands-on practice. Even a lot of sort of science, science lab uh, type courses where you're having to use your hands. And, uh, you know, computer classes, auto mechanic classes, anywhere where you're not just sitting there trying to remember things, but you're kind of uh, l learn by doing. And uh, language is that type of skill. So we want that, cl the English, the ESL classroom possibly could look a lot different than history classroom, business classroom. Uh, it could look different because some, and that's one of the reasons, because we're trying to use that class time to be very active and practice things. And, but, it, but it's a lot of fun. It makes for an interesting classroom. So that's the end of my introduction. And the next thing I'll go into, I'll start with, uh, with chapter one.